A few days ago, Dan McKellen responded to a video I made about slavery in the Old Testament. This video is a response to Dan's comments. First, Dan gets pedantic with me regarding the words condoning and approval. To this, I will just say that condone commonly has a connotation of approval, and I think it's clear that when people make arguments about the Bible condoning slavery, they are doing so with the idea of approval in their minds. Similarly, I think slave has connotations connected with slavery, as we know it from recent Western history. That's why people quote these passages as an argument. If Dan hears a slave and does not import ideas of what we learn in U.S. history classes that's great, but many do, and I think objections to Christianity take advantage of this connotation. Because slave has cultural baggage, it is appropriate to elucidate ancient Near Eastern cultures surrounding the concept. I did this by noting that the word translated for slave might better be understood as servant, though as Dan notes, not unilaterally so, and by discussing the idea of debt slavery. I focused on debt slavery because according to Raymond Westbrook in Volume 1 of his History of Ancient Near Eastern Laws, Hebrew slaves were usually acquired as a result of their poverty. I reference that Leviticus 25 displayed this idea of selling oneself into slavery as a result of debt and was accused of being intentionally deceptive. I think this is an inaccurate accusation, as Leviticus 25 does describe a person selling themselves into slavery due to debt, which is a reflection of the customs of debt slavery that is found in the ancient Near East, which is germane to my point. Dan suggests that I can't use other verses in the Torah to elucidate the, the Leviticus verse, and he does this because he holds to a view that denies that the Torah is a unified work and instead thinks that it is a variety of different sources strung together over time. While there are many scholars who hold to a view like this, there are also many scholars who have argued that this is false. I won't get into the details of this for time, but Inspiring Philosophy did a video going over the arguments for and against this position not too long ago that I suggest to those who are really interested to go and watch. Simply put, I reject Dan's view here, so I will be using the Torah as a whole to understand the various verses. With that in mind, next is the topic of non-Israelite slaves, which is referred to in Leviticus 25, 44-46. The verse does not mention a specific category, and considering the preceding context, context and prevalence of debt slaves in the ancient Near East, I think we can infer that these were debt slaves being brought from foreign areas. Josh Brown, who is an atheist scholar in this area, has made similar remarks that these were likely debt slaves being sold by their foreign creditors. So I don't think I am waxing elusive by talking about debt slavery in reference to this passage. Dan notes that these are chattel slaves. Okay, despite accusations that I am a slavery apologist, my remarks about debt slavery were to contextualize the nature of slavery in Israel and the ancient world by showing ways in which it was in contrast to what we are familiar with. This was done prior to me suggesting that God permitted these things for a time because he was meeting Israelites where they were at. Dan says that my argument regarding regulation and approval are irrelevant, but I don't think so. Guys like Hunter bring up these verses with the implication being that God God's regulation of this is indicative of his approval. I think Dan is being pedantic and is missing the broader context of this debate. Dan critiques my use of Jesus to understand the law. However, I and most Christians think Jesus has the authority to elucidate the meaning and intent of the Torah. So this verse comes down to, is Jesus divine and should we think his remarks about the law were accurately recorded? For those who affirm both of these things, my remarks about Jesus are relevant. Finally, Dan wants to say that just because it's possible that the regulations were given without approval does not constitute evidence that they were. In doing this, he wants to shift the burden of proof onto me and say, I have to provide some data for thinking that this is a case similar to Jesus' remarks about divorce. And saying this, Dan shows that he fundamentally does not understand the nature of philosophical argumentation. In general, the person putting forth an argument has the burden of justifying their premises. One cannot simply put forth a premise and then tell their interlocutor to disprove it. Imagine a prosecutor gets up and says, you should think Bob murdered Sally because Bob was at the location at the time of the murder and his fingerprints were on the murder weapon. Suppose the defense notes that Bob works at the murder location, was on a shift at the time of the murder, and regularly uses the murder weapon as part of his daily duties for his job, and so that the facts mentioned by the prosecutor don't necessarily support the idea that Bob killed Sally. It would be insane for the prosecutor to stand up and say, well, the defense has ginned up a possible 
logical explanation for the facts I provided, but they need to also put forth an argument for why we think that this alternate explanation is the correct explanation. No, this is clearly wrong. It's on the one making the argument that Bob killed a person to support their underlying assumption that these facts point towards Bob as the murderer. If an atheist takes a verse like Leviticus 25, 44 through 46 and says, aha, God says you can buy slaves, therefore God approves slavery, an implicit premise of their argument is that regulation should be understood as conveying approval. If I note that this link does not always hold and does not even hold for other regulations in the Torah, I have provided an undercutting defeater for their premise and their argument does not go through. If the atheist wants to maintain his original argument that the Bible has an approving attitude towards slavery, they need to justify why the regulations in Leviticus should be understood as approval. The type of strategy that Dan is pulling here is very common of internet arguers who think that at any turn they can just turn around and throw the burden of proof back on the person they're arguing with. It just simply does not work that way.